Good to go. Okay. Welcome, everyone. This is Meditation for Lawyers. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, this is not Mediation for Lawyers. So if any one of you signed up for a mediation seminar, you're in the wrong place, but we're happy to uh, have you. Please stay with us. And for those of you that were hoping for medication for lawyers, um, we have nothing tangible to dispense, um, but who knows, you might find your endorphins working a little bit more uh, at the end of this hour than they are, uh, they are now. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm George Philos. Again, thank you uh, for attending. Um, also on the webcast is my assistant and technical expert, uh, Will Nickel. Um, the goal this morning is, or this midday, is for you to relax and enjoy yourself. Second goal is to hopefully teach you how to establish a meditation practice and, med and meditate on your own. Let me give you a couple guidelines first. This is a one hour webcast and we'll end about, oh, we'll end with the formal part of it, about 10 minutes of one, which will leave 10 minutes for questions and answers. And um, if there are more questions and answers, I'm happy to stay on after that. And anyone, uh, feel free to stay on after one o'clock till we answer all the questions. Um, this is a visual. You can see me, um, I hope. Um, I can't see or hear you without your permission, nor can the attendees see or hear each other. So you rest assured that um, you are well within your zone of privacy here unless you would like to uh, be heard or be seen. Now, we have a chat room for technical questions. Uh, that should be on the right-hand side of your screen and there's a chat button. So you, if you have a problem with uh, uh, connectivity or um, volume or something like that, then please put it in the, uh, please note that in the chat room. Will will be monitoring that and hopefully we can straighten that out uh, for you. Now, on the bottom of your screen or somewhere on your screen is a, a Q&A icon. At any time, you can click that and submit a, a written question. I would, I would suggest for your questions, though, that don't, if you're spurred to write a question or ask a question, don't do it within the meditation segments themselves, because we're going to be alternating um, between We'll have about four or five meditation segments today, about five, six minutes long, and then um, some instruction in between the segments. So if you do have a pressing question, try to write it uh, in between the segments or at the uh, end of the meditation segments uh, today. Um, also, if you'd like to ask a question um, uh, verbally, there is, a, um, there is the raise your hand icon. And if you'd like to uh, ask a question verbally, that's fine. And um, Will will do the technical stuff to allow you to be heard. And if you'd like to be seen, we'd be happy to see you. And uh, we can arrange for that as well. The audio questions and answers, again, I would um, recommend that we do that, um, take those after the uh, meditation uh, segments. Now, One question that I do get almost ever on every seminar is, who is suited to meditation? I've had questions, well, uh, are certain personality types, uh, age groups um, better suited to meditation uh, than others? And there's only one prerequisite to meditation, and that's having an interest in it. If you have an interest, you have a seat uh, at the table. It's like poker if you play poker. You can sit down at a table with the best poker players in the world as long as you have the money to play. Here, your entry to the seat of the table is interest. So anyone who has an interest in meditation certainly um, can, uh, can meditate. 
Um, this, of course, is for CLE credit, and we will send you an email after the um, uh, after the webcast with the course number, so you can um, uh, enter that on the uh, bar website. Also, if there are any judges in the audience, as um, uh, I had mentioned before in a uh, in an email, we're applied. We've we've applied for continuing judicial education credits, and we'll give you that number uh, as soon as we get it. A couple practical things here. Choose a place. I hope your place is quiet without distraction. So if you have a cell phone, turn it off. If you have um, an assistant, ask them not to interrupt you for this hour, ask them to hold calls. If you have a giant sub sandwich um, or other goodies that you were going to eat today during the webcast, my advice would be to just defer that until, uh, until one o'clock uh, when we're done. Um, you want to have a uh, as, as quiet um, uh, and undisturbed location as is, as is possible. And of course, just make do um, with what you have and, and we'll do our best. Let's talk a little bit now about the outer posture of meditation. And um, we'll talk about the kind of the inner attitude later, but the outer, the outer posture sit uh, in a comfortable uh, position, if you have a chair with a cushion, you can, you know, you can support your back. I need to support uh, my back uh, these days. You can meditate in any position, but sitting is sitting about is better with an erect spine because you're more alert. You can meditate lying down. The thing is, our body is so accustomed to associating sleep. Um, with the with lying down, that it's, it's much easier to fall asleep when you are um, when you're lying down. If you're if you're sitting uh, it, rather than if you're sitting up, um, your hands you can leave your palms up and put them on your thighs. You can um, interlock your hands if you want to. Just put your hands in, in the most comfortable position. I would also recommend eyes eyes closed during the actual meditation sessions. Again, you can meditate with your eyes open, but in the beginning, as you are establishing your own meditation practices, you're learning how to meditate, um, having the eyes closed minimizes external uh, disturbances. So I recommend that. Um, and basically you want to have a relaxed attention. And a good analogy for that is focusing a camera lens or microscope, microscope lens. Um, you can be kind of um, over-focused or under-focused. Over-focused in meditation is being um, a little too attentive that borders on maybe a little nervousness, a little tension, so you want to be relaxed, but you don't want to be so under-focused or so relaxed that you start nodding off. So you'll experiment and see kind of what the sweet spot is for you. Now I'm just going to speak very briefly about um, why we're meditating. And of course, since you signed up, you probably know the answer to that question. Um, but we've all read in the Bar's Health and Wellness campaign, they had, an issue, they had a Bar Journal issue on meditation. Um, of the particular uh, stressors in the, in the legal uh, profession, and meditation happens to be a very successful way of, uh, or a very um, efficacious way of uh, minimizing and integrating stress. Um, we're here to meditate. Um, you know, you can read a lot of books about how to ride a bicycle, but until you get on and start pedaling, you're never going to learn. So, I'll just tell you very briefly about my experience, as many of you might know from my bio. Um, I've had some very stress-producing cases, particularly the Terry Schiavo case, the Right to Die case from 1997 to 2005. And at the end of that case, um, as it went up and down the federal court system, um, we'd be defending appeals uh, let's say in the uh, federal and the 11th circuit, 
and the appeal will be filed 10 a.m. and we'd get a briefing scheduled saying, you know, the initial brief filed by 4 p.m., uh, answer brief filed by midnight, reply brief by 4 a.m. or something like that. <laughs> and we were doing that, you know, kind of day after day after day. I mean, the, the, the stressors we face are great and having an established meditation practice was of great benefit to me. I don't know if I'm getting choked up or my throat is just uh, dry, but it was a great benefit because as with any practice, you don't want to start digging the well when the house is on fire. You want to have a ongoing practice that's there to benefit you when you need it. And of course, it's not just the stressors of a, of a legal practice, it's, it's just life will bring its uh, many challenges. So finally, I want to make, to emphasize that this is about your direct experience. This is not about what anyone tells you um, or what anyone, uh, or, or what you might have learned before or what you may have believed before. Be open, be like a scientist, be open to the facts of what you see in your own experience and trust your experience. And you know, this is the time that you've dedicated for yourself. So my advice to you is to make uh, the most of it. So we're gonna start with our first meditation segment. And so again, no worries, we're not, I'm not just gonna say let's meditate for, the, for 40 minutes. This will be a, a, a short segment, five or, six, uh, five or six minutes. A body centering and relaxation. So I close your eyes. Notice the contrast between silence and speaking. There's nothing for you to do, there's nowhere for you to go. And just notice the first sensation that comes into your awareness. The first bodily sensation. It could be the feeling of the air against your skin, against your forearms, the back of your, the back of your hand, the coolness of the air conditioning against your body. It could be the sensation of your feet against the floor, the sensation of the bottom of the soles of your feet, whatever surface they're touching. Could be a sound that enters your awareness now. Could be the humming of the air conditioning system. Might be a little chatter you hear from outside. It might be the sensations on the face. The muscles above the eye, the muscles in the forehead. Just let these bodily sensations, these sense perceptions arise. There's no need to do anything. There's no need to control anything. You may notice the sensation of your breath. It 
kind of a coolness as the air enters the nostrils, the tip of the nostrils. It could be the muscular sensation of the abdomen rising and falling as the diaphragm moves in and out. You might feel your heartbeat. There might be thoughts that are coming and going. And just for a moment, whatever sensation or sense perception a thought is occurring. See if you can notice a feeling of well being. Just the sensation of the air against your arm or the back of your hand. Is there a feeling of well-being, of relaxation? And just take a moment to notice how differently you may feel right now, as opposed to when we started this six minutes ago. And slowly open your eyes. I like to start with a meditation like that because for many people it evidences just the power, the, the great power of looking inward in just, for just a, a few minutes of time. Um, so I'm going to ask the question here, what are we interested in this? What are we interested in, in this meditation we're doing today? There are a lot of meditations. There are meditations on the breath. There are meditations on sounds, which are called mantras. People stare into flames. There's a lot of different types of meditations. What are we interested in today? And to answer that, I thought about that. And what we're interested in is authenticity. And why do we, a good question is why do we value authenticity? And we know, we know we do. We know a jury can tell in their great common sense, collective common sense, when you're faking it and when you're not. I mean, we can tell when we meet somebody, for the most part, not that, not that we can't be tricked. And I have, I've been tricked. Um, but we, we get a sense of who's being authentic and re, uh, with us and, and who's not. And an element of authenticity is, why we value it is because it's rooted in the truth. And the truth is, in a personal sense, being who you are. That's what we mean when we say they're being authentic, they're being who they are. And one of the benefits of self-authenticity and being who you are is, number one, there's a relaxation and relief. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything to be yourself. It's kind of your default position. 
So you can't lose yourself in a way because your default position is your authentic self. And you don't have to fake. You don't have to fake anything. There's no, there's no pretense. Now, pretense, I, I call the preamble to tension. Because when we're pretending, when we're in pretense, number one, you have to expend more energy to, be, to pretend to be what you're not. And there's also the flip side is that there's kind of a fear and anxiety about being discovered um, to be what you're not. We all have our shields and our faces and our armors and this and that and our, how we're putting ourselves forward. And there's that underlying current of, man, I don't want to be, I don't want to be discovered. Um, I don't want my pretense unraveled. So there's that fear and anxiety. And I want to be very clear. There's a difference between pretense and role playing. We all play roles. We're counselors, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, uh, um, employees, employers. I mean, we handle all those roles. And, um, but you can play a role and still be who you are. The difficulty comes is when we start to believe that we're the role we're playing. Um, and that causes, um, I won't obviously don't have to explain why that can cause many difficulties. You know, and the value of authenticity um, is so deeply rooted in our, in our culture that um, Shakespeare said it in, in Hamlet, um, to thine own self be true. And we could say that the current counterpart to that is get real. So that's what we're interested today in looking at what's, what's real. And I'll give you two definitions. One is that which cannot not exist. Something that is always existent. And another one is that which doesn't change. And when you when you think of that, when you think of that, you say, well, the only constant is change. What is there that, that, doesn't, that doesn't change? Now, we do know, we do know that we do know what changes all the time and what changes all the time are bodily sensations, sense perceptions, and thoughts. That's kind of what occupies the, the movie screen of our uh, perception. So in our next meditation segment now, we're going to take a look at that which changes. So again, if you need to, if you need to stretch a second, See, that was good. Uh, if you need to stretch a second, um, adjust your cushion, come to a comfortable sitting position, close your eyes, sink into your body, sink into your experience. And we're just going to take a look at what occurs. Like you're a scientist. I hear his voice talking. Sense perception. I have a, a thought came up. Oh, I got to file the pleading this afternoon. Just a thought. I feel a tingling on my nose, bodily perception, sense perception.
I hear a car. I hear a car driving outside, sense perception, excuse me, a, a sense perception. A thought arose, why the heck am I wasting my time doing this? Thought. Just whatever it is for you, just notice. What's arising? Is it a thought? A bodily sensation, a sense perception? And just let them, let them go. Imagine that you are the sky and each of those occurrences are just clouds passing through. Again, there's no need to analyze, judge, push away. They just come and they go. And notice how they all come and go. I feel the sensation of my abdomen. Where was that sensation before I was aware of it? It arose, it's here. It's gone. It's the same for a thought. Whatever thought arises, notice this beginning. There was no thought. Of course, there was no particular thought. There's a beginning. It's here and it's gone. Just kind of step back for a moment. And just notice that the perpetual arising, coming and going, is the same for thoughts, bodily sensations, sense perceptions. And you can ask yourself the question, is there anything else in my experience, Mr. or Mrs. Scientist, besides those three things? Is there anything else that is part of this field of perception other than those three things. And finally, Look to see are the three types of experiences, perceptions you have, thoughts, sensations, and sense perceptions. Do you know them in the same place? your knowing of these occurrences, are they different? 
makes the knowing different based upon what type of occurrence it is? Do you know a thought in a different place than you know a sense perception or a bodily sensation? Or is that knowing common to all? Okay, slowly, slowly open your eyes. So you had an experience of what is, what it is that arises in your experience, what that constant change consists of, and the fact that it, of course, comes, comes and goes. And I don't think it'll be too much of a surprise to you to learn that what we're really interested here today is not particularly the things that arise in your field of experience, but what it is that knows it. Now, the, we have to give it a name to talk about it. And it reminds me of a story of, um, or an article I read about questions of science and religion they asked third and fourth graders. And they asked a fourth grade boy, what is a vacuum? And he said, a vacuum is nothing, but we give it a name so it knows that we know it's there. Um, so we're gonna give, we're going to give that which knows an aware, uh, that which knows a name um, for purposes of our discussion. And we're going to call it awareness. Now, in our investigation of this awareness, which seems to be at the root of our experience, no matter what occurs in our experience, we want to investigate, does that awareness ever change? Is it, is it always there? Does it, does it cease to exist? Between thoughts and sensations, is there nothing? Do we cease to exist? Is there something else that exists? Okay, I don't want to get too esoteric in language because we'll see for ourselves. I did want to speak a little bit about, I talked about the outer meditation posture. This is the inner meditation posture. So how do we investigate this awareness? Now, one is by adopting an inner attitude of non-interference. And we talked a little bit about that before, that whatever arises, could be a happy thought, a sad thought, an unpleasant sensation, a pleasurable sensation, loud noise, pleasant, I mean, who knows? There's an attitude of non-interference. And what does that mean? It means that basically there's no judgment or comment about it. Now, you might say, well, I have a thought of the judge screaming at me in open court, and I have a self-comment, boy, that sucks, or why did that judge do that, or I have a judgment about it, I don't like that, I'm embarrassed. I mean, how can I not judge, how can I not comment? Well, the only thing you have to do is, if judgment or comment arises, don't judge the judge. Don't judge the judgment, don't judge the comment. That's all, just, just be aware of the fact that, ah, I had this thought and judgment. I'm judging the thought, I'm commenting about the thought. Okay, so you just notice that, that's all you need to do. It's the same thing with like and dislike. Liking something, a pleasant thought might cause a pleasant sensation of the body and the opposite with an unpleasant thought. Well, 
Okay, so you notice that. Um, past and future, we kind of, another part of interfering is projecting as to what's gonna happen next and or analyzing what's happened before. So all of this, all of this kind of secondary churning on our direct experience tends to dissipate with an attitude of non-interference. And it's like glass jars with a sediment. If we have mud or particles mixed up, you have an, uh, you have an opaque jar, you can't see through it. But if you do nothing, if you don't interfere, the sediment eventually, eventually settles and eventually the water clears and you can see through it. There's a clarity, a clarity of vision. It's the same thing with meditation. You know, some, when you start meditating, it's some, somebody said it's like putting my thoughts, emotions, sense perceptions, opinions, likes, dislikes, in, in a blender and pressing puree and it's all, it's jar number, it's jar number one. But there's nothing magical about it with just an attitude, just an attitude of non-interference. It's okay, judgment comes up, like comes up, dislike comes up, attachment comes up, doesn't matter. Just notice it, let it settle. The second internal posture in meditating is welcoming. And let's call that a benign indifference. By welcoming, we mean we're not excluding anything that comes into our experience. Oh, that sensation, that thought, oh, I don't like it, you're not welcome, get out of here. Um, it's just resistance, let's call it the opposite of welcoming is resistance, just puts and fuel on, on the fire. And that juiciness or attachment to your whatever thought or sensation or reaction to it, naturally lessens with an attitude of welcoming. And we can, I love the analogy of a mirror and TV screen. When you, whatever you put in front of the mirror, the mirror reflects. If you put a pink, Pink bowl, it reflects a pink bowl. The mirror says, hmm, I don't like pink. I would have liked a blue bowl. Um, that's, a, that's a benign indifference. Doesn't matter what's put in front of the mirror. The mirror just reflects it. And it's same thing on a screen. When you have, when you're watching TV on your flat screen, um, when the picture's on, when the picture's on, um, it could be a war story, there could be bombs, it could be a romance, it could be sweet, it could be, it could be horrible. Really doesn't matter to the screen what's being portrayed on the screen. And then the same in this meditation, your thoughts, your stories, your likes, your dislikes, whatever comes up for you, your sense perceptions, it's just, it's just on the screen. It's just on the screen. It doesn't affect the screen. No matter how many megatons of bombs goes off, the screen's not affected. It's the same in this welcoming and benign indifference is that you're the screen. You're the mirror. You're the cloud. That's, the po that's, a, that's a posture. That's an attitude. And if you say, hey, man, I can't remember all this, and, and don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm, you know, we're just germinating some words that hopefully will start an attitude. So just remember non-interference and welcoming as we do our next, our next meditation. Okay, again, come into a comfortable position. Close your eyes. You're doing great, you're doing great, keep going. 
sink into your body, sink into your experience. You may notice your breath. You may notice some bodily sensations. But right now for this experiment, and let's call it exp this experiment, you're just not interested in them. Whatever comes, let it come. One certainty is, is that whatever comes is gonna go pretty quickly. If you have a bodily sensation, just see that it's, what does it arise in? We could call it space, a metaphorical space. When it ends, where does it go? See if the space, the metaphorical space, contains the thoughts, the bodily sensations, the sense perceptions. Just notice for a moment. Is the awareness, is your awareness affected by the type of thought, perception, or sensation you have? is the proverbial screen upon which those occur, isn't bothered by them at all. Let's feel or perceive or sense an openness. Is there a boundary to the awareness? Is there a boundary to that which knows what occurs in it? Look. Can you find a place where the awareness, where your awareness is not, where your awareness ends? Does the awareness have any attributes like objects have? To sense the awareness and just ask yourself, does the awareness have a color? 
is that awareness blue or green? Does it have a shape? Now the things that arise in it that we're aware of certainly have shapes and colors. But does the knowing of those objects, the knowingness, the awareness, does it have a shape? Let yourself rest, deeply, deeply rest in that awareness again. There's an absolutely nothing to do, nowhere to go, nowhere to be, nothing to become at this moment. Now, ask yourself, does this awareness have a religion? Is it a Buddhist awareness? Is it a Christian awareness? This is your awareness. Is it Jewish, Hindu, atheist? Is this awareness an atheist? Is there any philosophy or dogma or religion that we can attribute to this awareness, this reality. And ask yourself, has this reality, has this awareness ever not been? Has there ever been a time where you did not experience this awareness, or this awareness was absent. Also, ask yourself, does this awareness have a gender? Does the screen, does the field upon which your experience occur, is this awareness male, is it female? Is it anything, can we attribute any gender to it? Okay, as, as you said, can you discern a quality of peace? Can you discern a quality of happiness? Okay, slowly open your eyes. So we can say that the meditation we're interested in here is just an exploration of that awareness. Now people say, well, hey, yeah, I maybe felt relaxed and I maybe felt restful, but we were in a controlled situation here. How does that benefit me elsewhere? 
it benefits you because we are so wrapped up in the story appearing on the screen, we don't recognize the screen upon which it appears. And just for purposes of argument, we can call the screen a greater reality because the screen's always there, the story comes and goes. If you watch TV, just notice tonight, you sit down and watch TV. When you're watching whatever you're watching, do you notice? Do you notice the screen? No, all our attention is taken up in the story. But consciously, watch TV, try it for a couple minutes, see the story, but retain an awareness of the screen. It's possible, it's possible to watch the movie, watch the TV show and remain rooted in the greater reality of that experience, which is the screen rather than the story. I, don't, I hope that analogy worked. Um, so it is, we have nine minutes left and we can, um, I'll leave it to you to, to vote. We can do another meditation or we have um, time for questions and answers. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this, um, Will? Let's start taking questions and answers. And if, we, if the questions and answers don't last the full hour, we can do a short uh, concluding uh, meditation. So I see we have one, We have one written question and answer. Let's take that. Okay. Michael Goldstein asks, white female light is my awareness. I have meditated for years. How do we take the time to meditate? Like flossing, we know it is good for us but how to get it, uh, but how to get to it every day. Um, well, one thing you can do is meditate while you floss and then you'd solve your problem there because you'll know, <laughs> you know you'll do it um, every day. Um, if you establish a practice, and by that I'd say start with 10 minutes a day. And you can do it when you first get up in the morning. I happen to, when I meditate, and I've meditated most, most of my adult life on a daily basis, um, I like doing it in the morning because if I have the intent to meditate later on, then I get distracted, something happens. So I like, I like the morning. So none of us, none of us is that, that busy where Oh, well, let me put it another way. If our life is so jam-packed that we don't have 10 minutes to devote to ourselves um, to meditate, then our, I think our life needs adjusting. So I think you can take 10 minutes a day to find a quiet spot and, and meditate. And the fact is that when you get the hang of it and meditate for, you become more established in your practice, then basically you can meditate anywhere. You're holding, you're holding on the phone and uh, you have a, a few minutes. Um, it's, it's basically during the day when you have a few moments, a little interlude between things, all you're doing is right now, the foreground is our thoughts, sensations, and sense perceptions and let's call it the awareness is in the background. When in meditation, you never get rid of anything. You're just bringing the awareness more to the foreground. That's all. And so as you meditate, you can do that anytime, any place. It's just to use the analogy, you're just, you're just remembering, you're just remembering the screen. So I would say, and that's easier to do, if you, set a t if you start by setting a time every day uh, to meditate and, and do your best. 
And I notice you mentioned white female light is my awareness. Now, who knows that the light is white? And I'll just ask you, Michael, this is something for you to think about. How do you know the light is white if something else is not aware of the light? And is the awareness of the light that knows it's white, is that white itself? Okay, we have a question from Joanne Stanley. Say the analogy again about watching TV tonight and being aware of the screen. Okay. Sit down and watch your, watch your TV and you're watching the show. And you're into the show, you're into the story. Notice that as you're really into the story, and that's why it's so fun, it's because it captures us. When you're into the story, you don't recognize that there's a screen upon which this story is being projected and shown. Just then pause a second and then watch the show and make a conscious choice that I'm going to remain aware of the screen as I watch the show. And you'll see not only is it, not only is it possible, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to do. There's nothing, there's nothing magical. Um, I, you know, I can give you another exercise, which is one that, um, what I like. Take a piece of paper and read what's on the piece of paper. Okay. Now, put the paper down and then pick the paper up again after a minute. And this time you're not interested with what's on the paper. You're interested in the paper itself, how the paper feels, the edge of the paper, the sense of the paper. The paper has, we can even say that the paper has a greater reality than the words on it. Because the paper can exist without the words, but the word, these words can't exist with this, without this piece of paper. So then, you know, you feel the sensation of your thumb touching the paper. You feel the sensation of the paper, then you put it down. And after a minute, you pick it up again. And you read the words. But at the same time you read the words, and you retain the sensation of that this is a paper, and you can feel the sensation of the piece of paper. It's not like you can't do one without the other. Um, people, and I'm, I'm glad I said this, most people have the misconception that meditation means no thoughts. No, of, of course not. You can, we can't exist in this relative world and practical world without thinking and without feeling and without, without perceiving. So in meditation, all we're doing is trying to adjust the balance by retaining the sense of awareness and the, the reality in which these perceptions and thoughts occur. And there's nothing magical about it. There's nothing spiritual about it. It's just that something you can do with a little practice. So we are, we are at the end uh, of our hour. I want to thank you so much for participating uh, in this. It's, um, you know, it takes a little courage, I think, to um, look closely at, at your experience. And please, um, if I can make this better or be of any other help to you, give me feedback. You have my, you know, my um, uh, website, meditationforlawyers.org. There are also a number of meditation questions and answers on the website there. And um, many of you have similar questions. You can check out the questions and answers on the website. There's an article, Meditation for Lawyers, there. Um, also, if you benefited from this, 
Um, you know, if you have a group, an organization, you're in a law firm, state attorney's office, public defender, um, governmental organization, please contact me and uh, we'll be happy, you know, to arrange something for your organization. And so, um, again, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye now.